Hey students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker. And in today's lecture, we're gonna take a look at the friction that comes from flexible belts. Okay, so when we talk about a flexible belt, we can think about that belt being basically wrapped around some kind of a cylinder. Now it doesn't have to be perfectly round. Let me go ahead and cut the belt off. I'll show, um, trying to keep a constant thickness. Okay, something like that, right? So we have a belt wrapped around a cylinder. You can feel this friction if essentially you take um, one hand and wrap your fingers around the forearm on your opposite arm, squeeze just a little bit, not too hard, but then try to rotate that hand around, okay? And you probably feel your hair pulling on your arm because you have friction going on between your grip and your forearm, okay? So that is this idea of flexible belt friction. So uh, the, the terms we're going to be focused on in a problem like this are going to be the tensions in this belt. That's going to be a key component here. So let's call this one for the start T2 and then the tension over here T1. Now there's two different fundamental situations. Either you'll be trying to rotate the belt around a non-moving um, pulley, at least if we're talking about a static system, or we will have a belt that wants to slip over a non-moving object, okay? So um, what we're gonna do for this example to derive our equations is to take a look if we have a, we have a pinned um, pulley and we've attached a motor to that pulley that we are applying a torque or a moment M, okay? Another thing that's really important in this concept of flexible belts is the contact angle, okay? And so the contact angle basically goes from where the belt leave, leaves here, the pulley, um, at a tangent line, over here to this side where this belt leaves the pulley. Actually, let me draw, draw this one, get it a little bit more, a little closer to tangent, say somewhere right in there, right, where we have perpendicular to that tangent line. And so we're gonna measure this angle this contact angle, so this is the angle beta, we call this the contact angle. And 100% of the time, this contact angle is in radians. If you do not put it in radians, you will get the wrong answer because essentially the equations are derived to always have that in radians. Okay, so we can think in this context that this is a fixed belt and that we have some impending motion of this pulley, which is basically going here rotationally impending motion. So again, here with flexible belt friction, we're gonna be focused on impending motion as opposed to static, but not impending. Um, and like I mentioned, we did the same thing for screws and we did the same thing for journal bearings. And so all these topics looking at impending motion. All right, so if we want to analyze what's going on with this pulley, we can go ahead, I'm gonna copy it here, do a little copy paste. There's my belt and then I also have my pulley. Okay, so we're gonna create free body diagrams of each of these as we think about the friction between them. All right, so let's start with the obvious forces. We talked about T1 and T2. We also have a pin here in the center of the pulley. So we could call this, we wanted to OX and OY. Okay, so those are kind of the, the most straightforward forces that are going on. Let's move that over there, give myself a touch more room around it. All right, and then we think about this friction, right? Friction always opposes motion. So let's go ahead and start that we have impending motion of this pulley due to this moment. The moment doesn't even include it on the free body diagram. And so if friction is opposing that motion, we could show that basically all along the contact surface, we have a shearing friction along that surface. Okay, so I'm drawing these as little one-headed arrows like we often draw for shear forces. And so th these forces are here. This is the sum of the friction force. If you think about the total of those wrapped all the way around that surface. And then we additionally have a normal force. Now I'm gonna draw the normal force in gray just so we have a little bit of contrast here. 
Um, it turns out the normal force is kind of small and it gets bigger on the far side and it gets a little smaller over here. It really depends on, well, it's a function of that tension. Um, but here we have the normal force. Now, as you look at this normal force, you might be like, oh my goodness, this is like a, a curving, non-constant value normal force. That, what a mess. Um, the nice thing is we don't actually have to do anything with the normal force in our computations. Another reason I drew it in gray. So because this is a frame and machine style problem, equal and opposite forces, let me go ahead and show here that here we have that same normal force along the contact surface. This time pushing on the belt. And then we're going to have the same friction force equal and opposite along here. All right, sum of normal, sum of friction. Tension, tension, pin forces, moment. I think that's everything. Oh, let's throw in a free body, or excuse me, let's throw in an axis system because that's just what we do for free body diagrams. All right, so as we think about the effect of this friction, it is fundamentally opposing the motion of the pulley. It's also um, accumulating to pull in the direction on this problem in the direction of T1. Okay, so if you wanted to think about writing an equation, and this equation could be the sum of forces, and we'll put along the belt is equal to, so we're going to call positive wrapped around here in the direction of T1. Okay, so we'll have the value of the tension in the, in the belt at 1. And then we're going to add to that um, the sum of the friction. And let's go ahead and make this equilibrium. And this is going to be minus T2, because T2 is pulling in the opposite direction. This is equal to 0. So essentially, I could rearrange this equation. Let me just move it here. It's kind of in a bad spot. Sorry about that. We'll pop it right down here. So what we can do is that we can use this equilibrium equation and write, a, write an equivalent equation that says T1 plus sum of the friction forces is equal to T2. So if that equation is true, which is bigger, T1 or T2? Of course, if we're adding something to T1 in order to get T2, T2 is bigger. And so the way I like to label these, I like to call T2 the larger T sub L and T1 the smaller T sub S. Okay, so I'm going to write it over here as well. So T1 is the smaller T sub S and T2 is the larger T sub L. Another way to think about these T sub, T sub S versus T sub L, which is an important thing. You do need to be able to tell which is the larger from the smaller um, tension in this cable in order to get the correct answer on these kind of problems. And, and the other type of analysis, we can focus on the impending motion. But it's not the impending motion of the pulley. It's the impending motion of the belt. Okay, and so as we look at impending motion, we can think that this is actually the absolute, absolute impending motion, right? Because that pulley is motorized, it has that moment applied to it, it wants to spin. The belt is not letting it spin. But we also have an impending motion. Now this is the relative impending motion. of the belt. And it turns out that this relative impending motion is always going to be in the direction of our larger tension. Okay, so again here, T2 is our T sub L, T1 is our T sub S, our small tension and our large tension. Okay, so the relative impending motion is always going to be in the direction so one more note here, relative impending motion of the belt is in the direction of the larger tension 
t sub l. Okay, so I think that's the easiest spatial way to look at these problems. Um, you certainly can think through the free body diagrams if you'd like, uh, but either way, you need to be able to tell the larger tension from the smaller. All right, in the textbook, there is the full derivation of where our fundamental equation comes from. And honestly, it comes from taking a little segment of this belt and creating a free body diagram and looking at the differential tension on either end of that um, relative to the differential or the amount of friction that's along that surface. Okay. Um, for this topic, I think it's just best to cut to the chase. We end up with an equation that tells us that T sub L, the larger tension, is equal to the smaller tension, T sub S, times E. This is the natural log power function E. E is going to be raised to the static friction coefficient mu sub s times the friction or the contact friction angle beta. Okay, so just a reminder here that E, this is the um, natural related to the natural log, right, related to L sub n. And you have, a, you have a function on your calculator, right, e raised to a power. So just hit that and then put in your mu sub s, which is your static friction coefficient. And then beta is your contact angle. And radians. Okay, so one full wrap, it's gonna be two pi, right? Because there's two pi radians in one full circle. So one interesting thing about this equation, as we take a look at it, there is no radius in this equation, and there is no assumption of shape, turns out, in this equation. So this equation is independent of these two things, the first one is size. And the second one is shape. Now there's gonna be a little modification here on shape. So it's independent of shape as long as the belt stays in contact with the pulley slash cylinder. Okay, so you can't wrap around a, a sharp corner because no belt's gonna be flexible enough to be able to do that, okay? So the key parts on this topic is we're going to determine which is the larger and the smaller tension by looking at either the relative impending motion of the belt, we know that's always in the direction of T sub L, or we think about the free body diagrams and having friction opposing uh, motion, right? And it's basically friction opposes the motion on the body that friction's acting upon. Right, so if different bodies have different impending motion, in this problem right here, we had a negative right-hand rule impending motion of the pulley, right, right here. We had a positive right-hand rule impending motion of the belt because they are moving opposite to each other relatively. So we'll get a lot more into relative motion as you get into dynamics. So we get a lot more practice with it there. Um, we have an equation derived in the book that T sub L, the larger tension, is equal to T sub S times E to the mu beta. So one of the challenges in this is, like I said, determining the larger tension. The other one is figuring out what beta is. Okay, so we'll go through an example next that you'll have a chance to take a look at both of those issues. So let's look at a problem. And so in this problem, we can think that we have a vertical wall and attached to that wall is going to be a cable, a cable, or actually let's just call it a belt since we're talking about flexible belts. Okay, so we have a flexible belt coming down here tangent to the cylinder and it's gonna drop vertically down this side. And let's say that we know that the um, tension pulling right here is 50 pounds, 
Okay. Let's also just give some information here. Let's say that this weighs um, 30 pounds. We're not actually going to solve this numerically. We're just going to ask some questions about it. And let's also say that we know the angle up here from vertical is 40 degrees. Okay. So my questions on this problem are twofold. The first one is what is beta? Okay, so find the contact angle beta, again, in radians. And then number two is the 50-pound tension. Is it going to be T sub L or T sub S? Okay, I would encourage you to go ahead and pause the video, see if you can figure both these out, restart the video, and we'll talk through them. All right, welcome back. Thank you to all of you who decided to pause the video, do some learning, and then come back and check your work. So let's first look at that contact angle. Okay, so uh, let me finish my free body diagram over here so we have all the details. So here is our 30 pounds. Um, we'll go ahead and basically leave a chunk of this cable. And here is my 50 pounds. And then another little chunk of the cable here. And just putting in some dimension lines. This needs to be vertical or as close to it as I can get. Um, I'd also have a normal force over here, right? The force of the wall on the cylinder. And I'd also have a friction force. Right, in order for this not to just slip down the wall, you can think that the impending motion of this of the of this cylinder, and if you wanted to think about this as a bowling ball or a log or whatever you want to think about, some weighted cylinder, we'd really need to figure out whether it's going to slip or stick at the belt or it's going to slip or stick at the wall. So let's make an assumption here, and you could check this if you wanted to later, but we're going to assume that this is going to stick. Okay, so if it's gonna stick and not allow this thing to slide down the wall, we actually have a friction force going upwards here. Okay, so there would be, now let's go ahead and give this a, a point name. Let's call this point A, just so I can give this a subscript. So this is F sub A and N sub A. Okay, and the last thing I'd have up here is some other tension. And really I'm trying to resolve if that's the smaller or the larger, okay? So if it's going to stick at the wall, and maybe you got hung up on that when you were looking, when I told you to pause the video, which is great. You actually, you discovered a very key point um, in this problem. So if it's gonna stick at the wall, the impending motion of the cylinder is positive from the right-hand rule, right? It's gonna roll down the wall. Therefore, the impending motion of the belt is going to be in the direction of T. And we said that the larger tension, T sub L, is always in the direction of the impending motion. And again here, let me just flush this out. This is the relative impending motion of the belt, where this is the absolute impending motion of the cylinder. Okay, just make that complete. And so it turns out that our uh, 50 pounds turns out to be the smaller of the two, T sub S, and the one pulling up to the wall is the larger. Okay, let's work through and find this angle. So I'm gonna delete some words here just to have some room to draw some um, geometry. All right, this angle, 40 degrees. I'm just gonna draw some triangles. Okay, so this is the triangle I think I'd draw first, a right triangle perpendicular to that wall. And that's a right triangle, I know that this angle over here is 50 degrees. Okay, I need to figure out the angle that is basically from tangent to T sub L to tangent to 50 degrees, right? So we do know because this is a tangent line that T sub L is acting along. It turns out that T sub S is also acting along a tangent line. Um, but that if I draw a radial line to the middle, it's always going to be 90 degrees between a tangent and a radial line. So therefore, if this is 50, again, a right triangle, it turns out that this is 40. 
Okay, that's very common types of triangles to be drawing to figure this out. It's worth your while to practice um, given some various angles on problems, and I'll make sure to do that on homework as well, that you can solve for this angle beta. So beta is 40 degrees, right? It can't be in degrees. It is 40 degrees times pi divided by 180 degrees. So it turns out that beta is equal to 0 0.698 radians. Okay, so that's, like I said, that's really the two most challenging things on these flexible belt problems is to figure out the angle and also to figure out um, which is T sub L and which is T sub S. After you have those, you basically could use this free body diagram. You know that you could use that equation to figure out the ratio of T sub S and T sub L. It becomes an additional equation into your free body diagram system, like additional to your equations of equilibrium, and then solve out for whatever is unknown. Let's go ahead and roll an example problem right into this video, just to keep it at one video for this topic. So in this example, we are going to talk about Indiana Jones. Okay, so whether you're a classic Indiana Jones fan with Harrison Ford or more of a 2000s Indiana Jones fan with Shia LaBeouf, um, they both use a whip, although I think Harrison Ford used it quite a bit more. Um, and so we are going to look at Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones coming through the Temple of Doom. And so I draw a really awesome Indiana Jones here as a stick figure. There is the fedora, okay? So that's how you know it's Indiana Jones. And there is a root up here. Um, let me actually do a quick little adjustment of geometry, move this down a little bit so I can get the proper angle. And so if Indiana Jones' arm is coming up like here and there is a root up top there, we have connected because he's holding in his hand his whip. It's coming up over this root and hanging down on this side. Okay, So I think about this in the context of the scene coming out of the Temple of Doom. And he's got the giant boulder chasing him. And he's jumping caverns and dodging um, blow darts and all those kind of things. And so, which of course, if you haven't seen the movie, you'll be like, what's he talking about? But fundamentally, we're going to be zoomed in on right up here at this root with this flexible belt, which is his whip, wrapped over the top of that root. And he stops to compute that we have a 30 degree angle between a vertical over to that, um, to his whip. And what we're curious about is how many wraps of his whip could he safely, basically could he safely get across this chasm? Okay, so here's the question, how many wraps to safely swing across the chasm. All right, so we're showing right here, I would call zero full wraps and just a little bit basically up over the top. Okay, so let's go ahead and specify some of the parameters. Let's say that Harrison Ford, fully laden with lots of treasure, is going to has a weight of 250 pounds. And so we're going to assume that's the amount of tension he needs at his hand in order to safely get across this chasm. Let's say there is a friction coefficient, mu sub s, equal to 0 0.5. And let's say the amount of the weight of his um, whip hanging over the top is 0 0.2 pounds. Okay, so it's a little bit hanging up over the top there. And so we could say that this is going to be um, T of 0 0.2 pounds. Okay, so now one thing we need to decide is the um, whether this weight, this tension on the far side is going to be the larger or the smaller. Now, one of the great things about any time that you have a belt that wants to move, right, the impending motion of the whip 
which is our flexible belt, is towards Harrison Ford, towards Indiana Jones. And so therefore, that's going to be the larger side. So it turns out that this is going to be T sub S. And what we're really looking for is, is T sub L bigger or smaller than 250? Okay, that's going to be kind of our criteria. And so in order to figure out the contact angle, I think usually best to blow up the root. Okay, so here's our root in cross section. And so here is the middle. And we know that the belt is going to hang off this far side and that it's going to come off here at a tangent line down in this direction here. So again, I can draw a triangle. And in this case, I'm going to draw, let's see here, vertical and at this tangent line from here to here. Yeah, that looks good. So this is perpendicular, a radial line to tangent. Okay, and so we also, if we know the angle down here is 30 degrees, I could actually transfer that angle up to here if I wanted to and say that this angle is 30 degrees. And so if that is 30, then this is 60, and this here is 30, and this one is 60, okay? So as we look at that contact angle, initially at least here, it's going to be this angle beta. And so we could say that beta is equal to 60 degrees plus 90 degrees, right over on the far side. And this is going to be this sum times pi divided by 180. And so we have an initial beta, which is equal to 2.617. This is in radians, okay? Now keep in mind, again, one full wrap is two pi. Pi is 3.14, so one full wrap is 6.28. And so this is showing here we're about a third of a wrap. It's always good to kind of think about the relative value. We don't look at angles and radians quite as often. So like, yeah, that makes sense. About a third of a wrap. This looks like about a third of a wrap. Okay, so I'm going to call this B naught because I'm going to say that this is going to be the um, the contact angle without a full wrap. Okay, B1 is going to be one full wrap plus this. So if we then want to find are T large with no full wraps, because T L sub naught, this is going to be equal to our smaller tension T sub S times E to the mu sub S times beta naught. Okay, so we put some values in here, we get 0.2, we raise E to the 0.5 times 2.617, and lo and behold, we have the grand value of tension available of 0.74 pounds. That is not going to do it. So Indiana Jones better get at least one wrap. Let's see what happens with one wrap. So this is one wrap plus the 2.617 radians. And so that's going to equal the 6.28 plus, um, which is the 2 pi plus the 2.617. So write out this equation, T L with one wrap is equal to the same T sub S E to the 0 0.5 times beta one. Okay, so this is equal to 0 0.2, still E, 0 0.5 is my mu sub S, and this is going to be 2.617 plus 2 times pi. So we have a total force available of 17.1 pounds with one wrap. Still not going to do it, right? Not nearly enough tension force. How many wraps do we need? Let's do one more. All right, so TL2 is going to be the 0.2 pounds times E to the 0.5, and then this is going to be times the 2.617 plus 4 times pi. This better do it. TL2 is equal to 396.5 
So we could say, therefore, needs two full wraps. Now, hopefully, as an engineer, you could also look at this problem and say, well, couldn't we have just solved for beta? And my answer would be yes, right? It wouldn't have the dramatic flair of thinking about no wraps, one wrap, two wraps. But yes, you could have solved for beta and said, all right, if this is the beta that I need, I need a minimum of two wraps in order to get that angle of beta. So another anecdote I have in this context is I learned to sail a number of years ago in the gritty city of Baltimore, Maryland. And on smaller boats, you often can get away with one wrap on a pulley. Okay, one wrap on a pulley will give you enough friction that between that and your grip strength, you'd be fine. But there's been a handful of times I've sailed much larger boats. And I remember taking one wrap on a pulley and the captain says, take another wrap, like sternly, directly to me. And what they're referring to is the fact that one wrap alone is not going to give you very much friction developed between that sailing pulley and your rope. And so if you're relying on the fact that you're holding the other end of that rope, um, you very easily could get a, a major rope burn and who knows what else would happen if that slipped. Um, so two things to remember is one, always take a second wrap on your pulley. The other thing is as we look at these pulleys, they're essentially, they look like this and they kind of wrap in this direction and they kind of come around the base, something like this. And these are often kind of a ratcheted pulley and you can also put a handle up here on the top. Uh, into a top hole, something like that. But as you're wrapping the rope around, you want to make sure that as that rope comes in, and wraps around here to the other side, I'm going to take another wrap around, it's going to come out over here, that you're always wrapping the rope around there with your thumbs up. If you ever get your thumbs down and the tension on that rope in the boat increases when you're not ready for it, there's a chance you could get your thumb in between this rope and that um, pulley winch. Um, that's, you know, it's essentially a cylinder on the boat. And with a very large amount of tension in that rope, um, there's actually people that have lost fingers in this way. Okay, so two things to remember is always take two wraps when you're on a sailboat and always keep your thumbs up when you're taking those wraps. So that concludes our lectures on flexible belts. I hope you have an awesome day.